Hi, welcome all to the online classes. I'm Mukesh Bhardwaj. Today, going to present a topic on ruby laser and helium neon laser in engineering physics, BTEC first semester. Welcome all. Now, I'm going to present the topic. So, the ruby laser in the first laser fabricated by Maiman in 1960, the population inversion was achieved in the following manner. It was made from a single cylindrical crystal of ruby, ruby whose ends were flat with one of the ends completely silvered and the other partially silvered. We will see in the figures later on. Ruby consists of Al2O3 aluminium oxide with some of the aluminium atoms replaced by chromium. The energy state of the chromium ion are shown in figure. The chief characteristic of the energy levels of chromium ion is the fact that the bands label E1 and E2 have a lifetime of 10 to the power minus 8 seconds, whereas the state uh, mug M has lifetime of 3 into 10 to the power minus 3 seconds. The lifetime represents the average time an atom spans in an excited state before making a transition to a lower energy state. A state characterized by such a long lifetime is termed as matter stable state. So, this is the diagrammatic representation of a ruby laser. In 26.16, the figure shows a glass tube, flash lamp, a ruby rod, and the laser beam. It is just excited with the external power source. And this is the actual representation. There's a power source, 100% reflective mirrors, quartz flash tube, ruby crystal. Laser beam is just ejected out, 95% uh, reflective mirrors, polished aluminum reflective cylinders, and the switch. The chromium ion in its ground state can absorb a photon whose wavelength is around 66,000 Armstrong or 6,600 uh, Armstrong and make a transition to one of the states in the uh, band. <clears throat> e1, it could also absorb a photon whose wavelength is 4,000 Armstrong and make a transition to one of the states in the band E2. This is known as optical pumping. And the photon which are absorbed, absorbed by the chromium ions are produced by the flash lamp. We will see in the figure. In either case, it is immediately makes a non-radiative transition in a time 10 to the power minus 8 to the matter stable state M. In non-radiative transition, the excess energy is absorbed by the lattice and does not appear in the form of electromagnetic radiation. Also, since state M has a very long life, the number of atoms in this tap state keeps increasing and one may achieve population inversion. Between states M and G, thus we may have a larger number of atoms in states M and G. Once population inversion is achieved, Light amplification can take place with two reflecting ends of the ruby rod forming a cavity. The ruby laser is an example of three-level laser. This is the diagrammatic representation. The energy levels of the chromium ion, G and M represent the ground and matter stable state respectively. In the original setup of uh, Maiman, the flash lamp filled with xenon gas was connected to a capacitor. We will see in the figure which was charged to a few kilowatts. Uh, kilowatts, the energy stored in the capacitor, few thousand joules, was discharged through the xenon lamp in few milliseconds. This results in a power which is an absolute of few megawatts. Some of this energy is absorbed by the chromium ions and uh, resulting in the excitation and subsequent uh, lasing action. Spiking in ruby laser, the flash operation of the lamp, lamp leads to a pulse output of the laser, even in the short period of few tens of microseconds in which the ruby 
is lazing, one finds that the emission is made up of spikes of high intensity emission as shown in the figure. The phenomena is known as a spiking, a spiking and can be understood as follows. When the pump is suddenly switched on to a value much above the threshold, the population inversion builds up and crosses the threshold value as a consequence of which the photon number builds up rapidly to a value much higher than the steady state value. Since the photon number is higher than the steady state value, the rate at which the upper level depletes because of stimulated transitions is much higher than the pump rate. Consequently, the inversion becomes below threshold and the laser action ceases. Does the impression that does the emission stop for a few microseconds within which the flash lamp again pumps the ground state attempts to the upper level and laser oscillations begin again. This process repeats itself till the flash lamp power falls below the threshold value and the lasing action stops. So this is the diagrammatic representation spiking, the characteristic spiking of the ruby laser. Now the next topic is that is the helium neon laser. Helium neon laser was first fabricated by Ali Jawan and co-workers at Bell Telephone Laboratories in the United States. This was also the first gas laser to be operated successfully. The helium neon laser consists of a mixture of helium and neon in a ratio of about 10 to 1 placed inside a long narrow discharge tube. We will see in the figure. The pressure inside the uh, tube is about one uh, tall. The gas system is enclosed between a pair of plane mirrors or a pair of concave mirrors so that the resonator system is formed. One of the mirror is very high reflectively, reflectivity while the other is partially transparent so the energy may be coupled out of the system. As you see in the figure, a helium neon, rays, uh, helium neon laser is shown. The helium neon laser demonstration at the Castle Brussels Laboratory at University of Paris says the glowing ray in the middle is an electric discharge producing light in much the same way as a neon light. It is gain medium through which the laser passes, not the laser beam itself, which is visible there. The laser beam crosses the air and marks a red point on the screen to the right. Next. The first few, oh sorry, the first few Energy levels of helium and neon atoms are shown in figure when an electric discharge is passed through the gas. The electrons travel down the tube, collide with the helium atoms and excite them uh, from the ground state F1 to the levels mark F2 and F3. These levels are metastable. That is, helium atoms excited to these states stay in these levels for a sufficiently long time before losing energy through collision. Through these collisions, the neon atoms are excited to the levels marked E4 and E6, which have nearly the same energy as levels F2 and F3 of helium. Thus, when the atoms in levels F2 and F3 collide with unexcited ne neon atoms, they raise them to the levels E4 and E6 respectively. This is the diagrammatic representation. Relevant energy levels of helium and neon is shown in the figure. Thus, we have the following two-step process. Helium atom in the ground state, F1 plus collision with electron. Helium atom in the excited state, F2 or F3. 
plus electron with lesser uh, kinetic energy. The excited states of helium, F2 or F3 are matter stable. They would not be readily lose the energy through spontaneous emission. The radioactive lifetime of these excited states would be about one hour. However, they can readily lose energy through collision with neon atoms. Helium atom is excited state F3 plus neon atom in ground state. Helium atom in ground state plus neon atom in excited state E6 similarly. Neon, helium atom in excited state F2 plus neon atom in ground state. Helium atom in ground state plus neon atom in excited state E4. This result in sizable population of the levels. <coughs> Sizable population of the levels uh, E4 and E6, the population in these levels happens to be much more than those in the lower levels E3 and E5. Thus, a state of population inversion is achieved and any spontaneous emission, uh, emitted photons can trigger laser action in any of the three transitions shown in the figure. The neon atoms then drop down from the lower laser levels to level E2 through the spontaneous emission. From the level E2, the neon atoms are brought back to the ground state. Through collision with the walls, the transition from E6 to E5, E4 to E3 and E6 to E3 results in the emission of radiation having wavelength of 3.39 micrometer and 1.15 micrometer and 6,328 Armstrong respectively. So this is the uh, pictorial uh, description. In the previous slide, we had seen the diagram. Uh, and this slide shows the description of that pictorial representation. Note that the laser transition corresponding to 3.39 and 1.15 micrometer are not in the visible range. The 6,328 Armstrong transition corresponds to the well-known red light of the helium neon laser. A proper selection of different frequencies may be made by choosing and mirrored, having high reflectivity over only the required wavelength range. The pressure of the two gases must be chosen so that the condition of population inversion is not quenched. Thus, the condition must be such that there is an efficient transfer of energy from helium to neon atom. Also, since the level marked E2 is metastable, electrons colliding with atoms in level E2 may excite them to level E3, thus decreasing the population inversion. The tube containing the gaseous mixture is also made narrowed so that neon atoms in level E2 can get de-excited by collision within the walls of the tube. Actually, there are large number of levels grouped around E2, E3, E4, E5, and E6, which we had seen in the figure. Only those levels are shown in the figure, which correspond to the important laser transition. Gas lasers are in general found to emit light, which is more directional and more monochromatic. This is because... This is so because of the absence of such effects are crystalline imperfection, uh, thermal in, in distortion and scattering which are present in solid state laser. Gas lasers are capable of operating continuously without need of cooling. Known as the quantization of charges or charge, it is given by Q equals to any. During Benjamin Franklin time, the electric charge was considered to be continuous fluid. Continuous fluid. This idea served many purposes. However, atomic theory of matter showed that fluid themselves are not continuous, but are made up of some atoms and molecules. It was in 1897 that J.J. Thompson uh, discovered the electron. It was in 1911, the Milligan successfully showed that charges on tiny oil drops are exactly multiples of elementary charge. Nowadays, we know from a number of experiments, the electric fluid is not continuous 
and all the charges occurring in nature are positive or negative integral multiples of certain minimum electric charge. This minimum electric charge is the magnitude of electric charge on an electron. This fundamental charge to which we give the symbol E has the magnitude of 1.60 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb. So the charge on electron is minus E while the charge on the proton is plus E. Okay. The fact that charges on proton and on the electrons are numerically equal but opposite in sign has been checked experimentally to an amazing degree of accuracy and namely to one part in 10 to the power 20. Any charge Q, no matter what is its origin, is given by 2 equals to plus minus any, where n is equals to the number of integer or stand for the integer value that is 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. When a physical quantity such as electric field, electric charge exists in discrete packets rather than in continuous amount, it is said to be quantized. This fact is referred to as quantization of electric charge. So I am repeating that when a physical quantity such as electric charge exists in discrete or packets rather than in continuous amount, it is said to be quantized. This fact is referred to the quantization of electric charge. When suitably examined on a microscopic scale, most of the properties such as mass, energy, angular momentum, etc. are observed to be quantized. The property of quantization of electric charge has to be kept in mind while dealing with electric and magnetic problems at microscopic level for many practical purposes or large scale phenomena. We can ignore the quantization of charge and regard the charge as something continuous. In the discussion of classical electricity and magnetism, the quantization of charge is completely ignored. This is because of the quantum of charge E is so small that greeniness of electricity does not show up in large scale experiments just as while breathing we do not feel that air is made up of atoms. Just as Newtonian mechanics does not correctly describe the behavior of matter on an atomic scale, the classical theory of electromagnetism also fails to describe the behavior of charge on the atomic scale. So, we simply say that Q equals to any where Q is the electric charge of any object or body and equals to any integer positive or negative where minus E is the elementary charge carried by the single electron or E is the elementary charge carried by the single proton. The charge on electron is written as minus E and this is positive. The quantization charge first suggested by the experiment laws of electrolysis discovered by Faraday. It was experimentally proved by Millikan oil drop experiment. The total charge on object is equal to the algebraic sum individually present within the object. If an object contains, <coughs> if an object contains n1 electrons and n2 protons, then, to then total charge on the object is n1 into minus e plus n2 into e. For example, if the object contains 150 electrons and 200 protons, then the total charge on the object is minus 150E plus 200E is equals to 50. Hence, the object is positively charged. The object charge can be exactly 0E or 1E or 2E dash 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 or minus 1E minus 2E but not in fractional value that is 1 by 2, 1 by 4 and so on. Next. Now these are the some methods of charging. The process of supplying the electric charge that is electrons to an object or losing the electric charge electrons from an object is called charging. So the process of supplying electric charge basically the electrons to an object or losing the electric charge electrons from an object is called charging. An uncharged object can be charged in different ways. 
charging by friction charging by conduction charging by induction so these are the three basic fundamental methods of charging by friction that is by rubbing you can charge or transfer the electron or by charging by conduction method or by charging through the induction method now let us discuss each methods of charging one by one charging by friction when object is rubbed over another object the electrons get transferred from one object to another this transfer of electron takes place due to friction between the two object the object that a transfer electron loses or loses negative charge electrons and the object that accept electrons gain negative charge that is electrons and the object that gains the extra electrons become negatively charged and the object that loses electrons become positively charged thus the two objects get charged by friction the charge obtained on the two object is called friction charge this method of charging an object is called electrification by friction now the charging by conduction the process of charging the uncharged object object by bringing bringing it in the contact with another charged object is called charging by conduction that means basically the conduction you just bring any charge object to the uncharged object in uh, contact with the uncharged object so the charge start transferring from the charge to uncharged is just simply like a you may call it as a diffusion or anything which is at higher density uh, moves towards the lower density or we can uh, call that suppose if you spray a perfume in a room from one corner so that perfume spread to the another corner because there is a low density wherever the low density is there the fumes or the fragrance of the perfume moves on through the medium of air similarly charging by conduction is the same process when you bring any charged object with uncharged object in contact with uncharged object the charge start transferring and this process is known as charging by conduction a charged object has unequal number of negative electrons and positive charges protons hence when a charged object is brought in contact with uncharged conductor the electrons get transferred from charged object to the conductor consider an uncharged metal rod a capped on an insulating stand and negative charge conductor b as shown in uh, figure below this is the figure in when one uh, uh, rod is insulating on a insulating stand which is totally uncharged and uh, rod b is uh, charged with negative charge when you just make rod b in contact with rod a the charge will equally get distributed or transferred to the rod a so this is called the charging method by conduction if we touch the uncharged conductor a with the negatively charged conductor b transfer of electrons from charged conductor to uncharged conductor takes place hence uncharged conductor gains extra electrons and charged conductor loses electrons thus uncharged conductor a becomes negatively charged by gaining of extra electrons similarly uncharged conductor become positively charged if it is brought in contact with positively charged conductor now the third is the charging by induction this is very important the process of charging the uncharged object by bringing another charged object near to it but not touching it it is called charging by induction that is influence by the influence of anything if we are going to deviate or divert 
then we can say that due to the induction consider an uncharged metal sphere and negatively charged plastic rod as shown in the figure in the next slide if we bring the negative charged plastic rod near to the uncharged sphere as shown in figure below the charge separation occurs this is the phenomena of charging through induction in figure first plastic rod and the sphere is separated with a distance and if we just bring uh, bring a plastic rod more closer to the sphere the negative charge in the plastic rod attracts the positive charge of the sphere towards it and uh, repel the negative charge towards another side and <clears throat> In figure third, if you just ground the ground it, uh, the ground the sphere, the whole negative charge moves to the ground, and the sphere will become positive, fully positive charge. And again, in the fourth uh, figure, you just again separate both the rod in the sphere the positive charge in the sphere get attracted towards the plastic rod and move to one end of the sphere that is closer to the plastic rod similarly negative charge get repelled from the plastic rod and move to another end of the sphere that is farther away from the plastic rod thus the charges in the sphere rearrange themselves in a way that all the positive charge are nearly nearer to plastic rod <coughs> nearer to plastic rod and all the negative charge are farther away from it if this sphere is connected to a ground through the wire as shown in figure free electrons of the sphere at farther and flow to the ground thus the sphere becomes positively charged by induction if the plastic rod is removed as shown in figure 4 all the positive charge spread, spread uniformly in the here. Next. Now we are starting with Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law. Yes. Coulomb's law, the study of electrostatics begin with the Coulomb's law. The study of the electrostatics between the Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law is experimental law published in 1785 by French physicist Charles Augustine de Coulomb. Uh, <clears throat> Charles Augustine de Coulomb uh, Just wait a minute There's some problem Yes, the study of electrostatics begins with the Coulomb's law Coulomb's law is experimental law published in 1785 by French physicist Charles Augustine de Coulomb this law is very important for the development of theory of electromagnetism. Uh, Charles Coulomb observed that Charles Coulomb observed that when two electric charges place 
are placed close to each other the experience of food he used the torsion balance to measure the repulsive and attractive force between the charge particles so the statement of coulomb's law <clears throat> charles coulomb has developed the two laws on the basis of his experiment which are known as coulomb's law of electrostatics first law coulomb's first law state that two charged particles of same charge two charged particles of same charge positive and negative will repel each other and two charged particles of opposite charge one positive one negative will attract each other okay second law coulomb second law states that the force of attraction or repulsion force of attraction or repulsion between the two electrically charged particle is directly proportional to the product of magnitudes of two charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between two charges this force of attraction or repulsion between two charges is also known also depends on the medium in which the charge are placed so electric charge is a scalar physical quantity which determines the interaction between the charged bodies coulomb's law discovered in 1785 these with this electric interaction the this law is analogous to newton's law of gravitation <clears throat> coulomb's law was discovered by cavendish but this fact became more known only after 65 years of his death <clears throat> According to the Coulomb's law, electrostatic force of interaction between two point electric charge is directly proportional to the product of the charges, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them, and acts along the straight line joining these two charges. Strictly speaking, Coulomb's law applies to the stationary point charges. If two point electric charges Q1 and Q2 are separated by a distance d. then the electrostatic electrostatic force between the two charges is given by force is directly proportional to q1 and q2 upon d square or we can say that electrostatic force is equals to proportionality sign is removed by constant k into q1 q2 upon d square where k is a positive constant of proportionality called electrostatic force constant or coulomb's constant its value depends upon the system of units and also on the medium between the two charges if the point charges are in vacuum then i'll show in the next slide <clears throat> if we increase the distance between the two point charges that force of attraction or repulsion between uh, repulsion present between them will decrease in the similar way if we decrease the distance between two point charges the force of attraction repulsion between them will increase coulomb's law can be mathematically written as i had already if you know proportionality sign is replaced by k which is known as coulomb's constant k and its value is depending upon the medium so where f equals to the force of attraction or repulsion between the charges <clears throat> q1 q2 is the magnitude of charge first and charge second d is the distance between the two charges k equals to the constant whose value depends on the medium in which the charges are placed 
and k is given as 1 by 4 pi epsilon where epsilon equals to e naught e into e r so it can be also written as k equals to 1 by 4 pi e naught uh, e r where e naught is known as the permittivity of vacuum that is equals to 8.854 into 10 to the power minus 12 f by m or er is the relative permittive of the me medium with respect to free space okay so e naught epsilon naught is the permittivity of vacuum and its value is 8.845 and er is the relative permittivity of medium with respect to free space For vacuum, the relative permittivity ER equals to 1. Hence, permittivity is equals to E naught. Therefore, the force of attraction or repulsion between two electric charges that are placed in vacuum and medium is given by. In vacuum, it is given by force equals to Q1, Q2 upon 4 pi epsilon naught D square. Uh, or in, in any medium, it is uh, represented as force equals to Q1, Q2 upon 4 pi epsilon naught Er into D square. Now, before moving to electric field, that is the next topic. In continuation to the uh, Coulomb's law, Coulomb's law in vector form having the great importance <clears throat> so as we know that the like charges are attracting each other and unlike charges uh, unlike charges are attracting each other like charges are repelling each other Consider two point charges Q1 and Q2 separated by some distance d. If the product of the magnitude of charge is greater than zero, that means both are positive, or if the product are negative, then the charges repel each other. On the other hand, if we say that the product of uh, two charges is less than zero, charge are dissimilar, then the charges attract each other. So as we know, the force is a vector quantity. So the electrostatic force or the Coulomb's law or that is given as force equals to K Q1 Q2 upon R square is a vector quantity. And uh, by calculating the resulting force, keep the vector theory very clear in mind because whatever the resultant force we have to mention the direction of the resultant force when a system of charges are um, taken up and if we ask to find out the what is the charge uh, or what is the force on the one charge due to the all of the charges and the resulting direction of the forces then the vector theory must be very clear to us for calculating the force <clears throat> the SI unit of charge is Coulomb. Now, if you had gone through the gravitational field or gravitational forces or gravitational theory, we find the formula of electrostatic force and the gravitational force is almost similar. In addition to the electrostatic force between two charged bodies, there are also exists a gravitational attraction between them. Uh, so, points of similarity while doing the comparison of electrostatic and gravitational forces, both of these forces are central forces. That is, they act along the line joining the centers of the two interacting bodies. Both the forces 
obey inverse square law of distance as you had seen in the formula both are conservative forces that is the work done by them does not depend upon the path followed both the forces are can operate even in vacuum now uh, points of dissimilarity while the gravitational forces are always attractive in nature the electricity force may be attractive or repulsive while the gravitational force does not uh, depend upon the medium the electricity force definitely depends upon the medium electrostatic forces are extremely large as compared to the gravitational force the fact that electrostatic forces are much stronger than the gravitational force is clearly revealed from the following illustrations uh, or some illustrations which we'll see later on <clears throat> <clears throat> now starting with the topic that is electric field electric field the region around a charge particle within which other charge particle will experience an electrostatic repulsive or attractive force is called electric field electric field is also called as electrostatic field the electrostatic force or electric force is exerted by the static electric charges that is electrons and protons next so electric field as you see in the pictorial representation of the charge that is positive charge and negative charge is showing to you in the diagram and the rays are moving perpendicularly away or towards the charge so we can say these moving lines which are in the perpendicular from the charge are known as electric field of lines okay so now the electric field strength the strength or intensity of the electric field at any point within the electric field is called electric field strength to describe an electric field we must specify its strength the strength of electric field at any point with within the electric field is determined by placing the unit charge at that point when the unit charge is placed in electric field it will experience an electric force the electric force is either attractive or repulsive the amount of electric force acting on a unit charge placed at any point within electric field is called electric field strength or electric field intensity <clears throat> so more specifically we can say that there is region of space around a charge of a system of charges within which other charge uh, particles experience electrostatic force this region is spoken as electric field thus a particle is said to be in an electric field if the particle experiences a electrostatic origin theoretically theoretically speaking the electric field extends up to infinity but practically the electric field does not show detectable influence beyond a certain limited distance the electric field strength or field strength or electric field intensity or electricity is the ratio of the electric force exerted or experienced by a positive charged particle to the magnitude of the charge q not on the particle so we can say mathematically e is equals to force upon q not since q not has been taken to be positive therefore the direction of electric field will be the same as the that of force so we can conclude that electric field intensity is also a vector quantity it is also clear from the definition of electric field the electrostatic force on a negative charged particle will be in the direction opposite to that of the field strength it is further clear from the definition that electric field intensity is a vector quantity whose magnitude and directions are uniquely determined at every point in the field thus electric field is a vector point function <clears throat> 
it must be clearly noted that electric field is external to the test charge that is electric field is neither the field produced by the test charge nor it is supposed to include any contribution from the test charge in fact electric field exists whether some test charge is placed in the field or not so we can say that if the amount of force acting on a unit charge at a given point is less then electric field stand at that point is less in the similar way if the amount of force acting on a unit charge uh, on a unit charge <clears throat> on a unit charge at a given point is high the electric uh, field strength at that point is high electric field strength or le intensity is a vector quantity it has both magnitude and direction electric field strength can be mathematically defined as force per unit charge as we know that force is measured in newtons and charge is measured in coulombs hence electric field strength is measured in newtons per coulomb types of electric field so <clears throat> there are basically four types of electric field the electric fields are of four types uniform electric field non uniform electric field static electric field time varying electric field uniform electric field uh, so i would like to continue this lecture uh, the types of electric field or the particular topic that is types of electric field in the next lecture uh, till to now thank you thanks a lot Have a nice day.